Hello and welcome to another edition of the Box I Live In podcast with me, Ben Reeve, and my co-producer and all things pod, Blake Howard. How are you, Blake? Good, Ben. Great to see you again. How you doing? And very well. And today's special guest who has enabled me to actually tick something off of my to-do list, Denise Cheng. How are you? I'm really well. Great to be here. Yes. And the reason I can tick it off my to-do list is because you and I caught up and it was back, wasn't it? January, February, I think, because I always know because I think, I mean, obviously with COVID and everything, but we're in town, but it was still quiet, you know, so it's either the holiday season or people haven't come back. And we had a chat and I said, I'm doing this podcast. And I think, you know, at the time you're obviously kind of aware of all this stuff and you were quite excited. And I thought, oh, well, which is kind of, and I knew you'd be a good guest. And here I am. It's only taken me 10 months, but it's great to get you on the call, <laughs> get you on the pod. No, it's real exciting. It's, um, you're always a bit wary of, uh, of just revealing all, but no, um, it's, I'm really pleased to be here. And Ben, you and I have been working together for uh, a couple of years now. I first, uh, um, for everyone on the on the podcast, uh, I first met Ben when he was facilitating a um, course that I was part of. So I was lucky enough to be part of uh, the uh, Social Change Makers course as a, a a grant beneficiary of Westpac, and um, it was yes. uh, and then yeah, that started our uh, our friendship, and and um, yeah, and here we are today. And that's kind of what I'm excited about, because to date, we've done a lot of conversations with sort of people in the commercial space. And and and, and the theme is literally on when I when I'm doing this, I said to Black, I said, right, who do I talk to? Because I'm like, we can talk to anybody. And he goes, well, who who have you met that's interesting? And so, you know, and that's where you come into this, because, you know, as I said, we've been doing a lot of people in the commercial space, but you you kind of come out of that space. But you now work sort of more into the and I don't even still have the terminology charity, not for profit. I've got it written down here for purpose, social enterprise. So let's start off by talking. Talk us through what you do today explain your role because I do think your role is one of the most fascinating roles I've come across so what do you do for a living what do I do for a living I often say um, I probably have my dream job and I never anticipated that this would be where I would be um, 20 years into my career but I um, my official title is relationship manager philanthropy and I work for an organization called equity trustees and we are a professional trustee company so we're a sex listed we are a corporate but um, the role that I have is an incredible fusion of both corporate um, and the for purpose sector which is often the the term that's used these days but effectively what I do is I help families and individuals on their philanthropic journey. So I help them uh, structure their giving um, and be able to give away their wealth with thought and purpose. And that's what I do every single day. Now, the interesting part is, see, because it's it's not just the families. It's actually also then this connection for all the entities that are looking for, yeah. whether it's donations or for grants. And, and, and that's the bit where you and I kind of connected, didn't we? Because this social change program that I ran, um, again, sponsored by a, a large financial organization, they said to me, can you come and run a leadership program? And, and the audience was, you know, change fellows, people that were passionate about projects, people from charities, people from running social enterprises. And, and, it, and I kind of thought, well, actually, what, what can I help here? Because I did not understand the sector at all. And I still think I'm struggling a little bit. And, and you know, I am quite commercial, as you know. So for me, it's like, well, you know, if it's not sustainable and it can't fund it, why are we doing it? And if we're relying on handouts, I get it. And I know you've got a passion, but doesn't it just create stress for everybody? Like how many people can you really help? So I came at it a little bit kind of nervous in a sense, because I know the, the psychology of what we talk about and the leadership stuff's valid, but I didn't know it was going to resonate in the sector. And I think that's where you and I kind of hit it off because there's that line, isn't there, between the commercial need, and I guess you see this in your role today, what the families want, which is to give, but also the sustainability behind that, but also the recipients. So, so you, you, you don't just do the families. It's also working with the entities, right, in, in the sector, the people that could benefit from this um, ph- philanthropy. Yeah, definitely. So um, an interesting sort of side point is that I actually come from the sector. So I started my career in in corporate. So I've come out of um, a business development and sales background and, and a bit of marketing as well was a part of the big four in terms of accounting and went into law and a few other things. I went from there in actually into not 
nonprofit. So I actually became a fundraiser and was the one asking for money. And now um, for the past three years, I've been on the other side and, and, and what we call a grant, um, a grant funder or grant maker. Um, I think part of my role is to work with um, beneficiaries. So organisations that already receive um, funding from our trust, but also potential beneficiaries, understand their why, understand their purpose and their mission and, and how they go about solving some of those big, hairy social issues that we've got out there, and then align their purpose with the interests of my family. So um, it's, it's definitely a, um, a understanding of, of what's going on both sides and finding and facilitating those introductions in the middle. And the beauty of my background of having been on the fundraising side and the not-for-profit side is I actually have a real appreciation for what are some of those really core fundamental um, challenges that they're dealing with and where the opportunities are for the philanthropists to really actually make a difference and to create impact. So we, the, the word impact um, gets thrown a lot and it gets banded about, um, but it's, I think, become even more critical now, um, particularly in COVID times. Like we've seen revenues decrease, fundraising dollars decrease, we've seen increased community need, um, and more and more we're questioning what difference are we making and how can we actually measure the difference that we're making. And so um, I'm constantly having those conversations both with my philanthropists as well as uh, the beneficiaries. Um, and uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting for me. And there's a couple of things I want to explore today with you. I think the first one is your personal journey and this sort of going from the corporate world and then kind of jumping into the into the sector, as you said, as a fundraiser, which again, you know, is kind of like the motivation for that. And then I think the secondary part is this, you know, impact and for purpose and, and some of your thoughts around, because I think there's a lot of people interested in this space and giving back. And that's, I think that's a real generational shift and we can explore that, but let's go back to you. So, so you started out in the commercial space, as you said, sales, marketing, work for some of the big brands, the big names. Um, and then you went and jumped in and did some basically, what was it, fundraising, you said? So, so what, what, yeah. what prompted that shift? Like, did you have a, like, wake up one day and just question what life <laughs> is all about and just decide you're going to get out? Yeah, um, I, it was definitely a journey. It wasn't, it wasn't a light bulb moment that happened one night and was like, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go into the not-for-profit sector. It probably was an evolution of about, about 10 years and um, I'd been working, um, for about probably seven or eight years. And, and so I was, and hey, I was coming out of university, had a Bachelor of Business. I had every plan to be, have the CEO corner office and, and make my way to, and through the ranks up to the top. And, and I was, I had all the plans in the world to achieve that. Um, but I reached a stage in my career, it was my third um third role and I actually started um querying what was what was I doing and I think it really all came to a head when I was invited to join the board of my high school so I I joined the school council um, and I was part of these incredible conversations around what the teachers were doing to support the the young women in, in, in the school and, and what were the ambitions of these women and how was this education system going to support these women to, to be the, their best persons. And we were having these conversations at the board table and I'm like, I, I surely, surely there's more I can do. Surely there's greater impact that I can personally have on my community. And, um, and that sort of got me thinking about, well, what, where do I go? What can I do? And I ended up moving into um, a, a law firm at that point and, and was still having these conversations. Part of my concern was actually a very fundamental one was how am I going to pay my mortgage? If I, if I go into the not-for-profit sector, I, I am going to take a pay cut. 
how am I going to how am I going to afford to live and pay my mortgage? And so that was actually a very real element of of my thinking. And thank you but- for saying it, Denise, because <laughs> I think that people who are listening to this show and even me being a part of it, I love hearing that. And we talked about it with Radha Gopali as well, which is like you do actually have to make fundamental decisions about your lifestyle. And so no matter what, definitely- if you are going to take a pay cut or whatever, that's totally understandable. But there has to be a point where, you know, I think that a lot of people don't like people don't like dancing around it. And I love that on this show, we have it. It's like, no, you have to make your choice. Sometimes what is your lifestyle? You you got to pay a mortgage. You want to have a house. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it it is a choice. And I think as I made this, um, some, some of those decisions, I ended up taking a a sidestep. So left the law firm and actually went and worked for a membership organization. And for me, that was a very strategic move to say, I'm not quite ready to move into to 100% not for profit. I'm not quite willing to make that get take that massive pay cut, but I do want to experience something that has um, has a different purpose to effectively revenue and bottom line and things like that. Um, I also wanted to improve some of my leadership skills and management skills as well. So there was a strategic decision there, um, but underlying that was I I, I was still unhappy in my in my work and my role and I and then my outputs every day weren't bringing joy and um it was about a year and a half two years into that job that I actually made some strategic decisions to to make a move into the not-for-profit sector and for me that involved a lot of conversations with um individuals that were so board members that were on um, boards of charities um people that were collaborators in the sector. Um, And I had some incredible conversations and people were incredibly generous with their time and to share their knowledge with me um, about how to enter um, the sector. Um, And and Blake, to your point, we I I I made a decision to say, okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm going to make a move. Worst case scenario, I exit and I go back to a, a nine to five corporate day job worst case scenario best case scenario is I, I find something that I'm passionate about um to the to the point that at that time um we were it was 10 years ago I don't think the not-for-profit sector was as um as comfortable as they are now with um exploring opportunities to engage those people from the corporate sector. At the time, they wanted people that had had experience in not-for-profit. They wanted to know that people had track record in, in fundraising in, in my instance. And they were wary about taking that risk because they were like, oh, we're, we're under-resourced anyway. We can't afford to train you up for six months before we let you loose. Um, so I think I had 60-odd applications and I think I achieved two interviews um, and I ended up getting a role at a, a, a women's organization and I was lucky enough that the CEO at the time was ex-corporate she had made the move and she was willing to take the risk on someone who had, didn't have a not-for-profit background who didn't have the experience but ha- did have transferable corporate skills um, and and I am forever thankful to her for giving me a chance but I actually took a part-time role, three day a week um, contract for six months. Like I was willing, I took that risk and I was like, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to the to fate. And, and if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Um, and 10 years later, I've, uh, I've had, um, had, had six, seven years of fundraising experience. I'm now on in the trustee world and, and yeah, it's, uh, it's been an evolution. And what's the, What's the difference? Because I think I think yeah. what's interesting for me, and I've seen this even in the three or four years that I've been sort of working this, I, I think, you know, the old school world was kind of like the sectors, never this train shall meet. You know, if you're in the if you're in the charity sector, and I think and I think when I was growing up, it was very much the, you know, you were you were new money and then you kind of give it away, you you give your time, you go and do stuff, or you make a donation. And I think in that old school world, the sort of commerciality and then the charity sector were kind of separate. But I think, like I said, even in the last three or four years that I've been talking to you, I think there's been this blurring of, yes, but is that sustainable? Particularly when also you've got people that wanted to tackle different challenges, like we talk about social enterprises. So, so, so for me, though, is like going from, you know, let's be honest, a well-funded 
kind of corporate job. And I found that when I left, you know, did my own thing, all of a sudden it's like, who's going to fix the printer if it breaks? <laughs> Shit, it's me. And it's like, you know, having that card, because when you work for a brand, it's kind yeah. of there. And then you end up on the other side of it. And, and it's like, just, just when you reflect back on that sort of seven, 10 year journey, and even before, what are some of the main differences? Like, what is it, is it as chalk and cheese or are there similarities? Like what's, what's the difference between the, the, the corporate and the private or the public sector yeah. or, the, or the charity sector? There are so many similarities oh, and good. yet there are so many differences. It also does depend on where you end up. So obviously working for a, a big brand charity, um, they do have the resources and the governance and the structures that make it very, very similar to um, the corporate and commercial world. And to be honest, I think the reality of, of um, our world is that charities are run like businesses these days they have to in order to be sustainable in order to to have the infrastructure there to support their clients and their beneficiaries they have to actually work um a smart effective efficient um and and they've got to have strong governance otherwise um philanthropists wouldn't fund them and they wouldn't get money from government and 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 the like um so it does depend on where you are on the, in the spectrum. If you're going to work for a, um, a small charity that has one or two people, it is going to be very, very different to the corporate world. But um, one of the things I was reflecting on in preparing for today was, to be honest, I thought when I left corporate and I went into not-for-profit that it would be all shiny and bright and bubbly and and happy days and I'd be there and doing like something that fulfills the soul and, and that, um, and it would be, I would be like doing something that was just genuine and with purpose and, and yes, all of that happens. But on top of that is the overlaid of um, you've got, you're under resourced, you are, you, <laughs> laptops are old you you might not have access sometimes a state there's nothing in the stationary cupboard where in, whereas in commercial you'd be able to open it up and there would be um, if, if anything you could dream of and, and not, again I'm, I'm being a bit flippant but it is charity land is um it's not all rose tinted glasses it is hard hard work it is um but I think at the end of the day you know you're working to a, a greater purpose you are you, you you speak to beneficiaries you understand what that the charity is trying to do and you realize that you go home at the end of the day and you go damn I I, I made a difference today um it may be only a little bit towards the bigger goal but you make a difference and that is fundamentally and it's the reason why I still do what I do it's my why it's that because you know you're making a difference and as corny as that sounds it's it's it is the reason why so many people in this sector are in this sector and why they make the move from corporate or have have um uh are working for very for very little is because they believe in that in that that purpose and um and, and I think that's an interesting thing with the for purpose sector is that people are amazingly passionate in this um and sometimes to their detriment some like you see a lot of founder led and, and Ben you've you've coached a lot of um uh leaders who are the founders of their charities and they will do everything and anything to ensure that their dream continues um, and sometimes to the detriment of their personal well-being um, and yeah. that is something that is a big um, area of uh, concern in the sector is that burnout is that because people are so passionate about what they do when they see the need and, and see the problems that we're trying to solve for um, we it's it's about resourcing the sector in an appropriate way to I, yeah to and stop I think that and I think that's probably the intersection between you and I in terms of you seeing that. And and as I said, you know, I I had I didn't even know there was a for purpose sector or a social enterprise thing. I'm honestly, <laughs> that's how naive I am, right? It was, and and but I guess it's always interesting because you know if you if you take a corporate group, and again we try not to generalize, but it's, it's yeah. Sometimes the hardest part in a corporate job, exactly like your journey, is finding the why. Why do I do this? You know, the interesting work can be fun and the toys and all of that, but but you know, what is this meaningful enough? You go and do a program with a group of social entrepreneurs or people that work in charities or the founders, they know their why. You know, their why is an absolute passion. The, the, the challenge, though, then is and it still is, is about the 
what, what I call the system, the com it's not commercial acumen. Well, it is commercial acumen, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, it's money flow. It's just that we're not trying to make money. We're trying to dispute or, or, or create, uh, create value. But it's that capacity to build something that is, I guess, sustainable, does a good job, whether that's to one or a thousand, but equally doesn't, the toll is not on the individuals. And, and I think the hardest part for me is to see that passion. And at times, you know, when I'm having these conversations, I almost feel like I'm the, you know, the, the person that's turning up quashing people's dreams because I'm looking at them working themselves into the ground and I'm like I know you care but it's like sometimes you've got to care a little less because you lose perspective and, and I think this is the interesting thing about the sector today is that th there is this and, and maybe this is probably I'm interested in your you know your view on it I mean the traditional charities as you said are well set up but there's this not-for-profit there's this for yeah. purpose this social enterprise which seems yeah. to be this blend between i've got a passion and i want to help but equally i've got to run it as an entity so can you definitely. help explain to me again yeah. like how all this stuff fits together yeah, you know the no, charity the, for purpose social enterprise like, like how does it all play together yeah and and i think i think traditionally we've we've talked about charities we've talked for not-for-profits and i think over the last sort of 15 20 years we've actually seen a true evolution and it's reason why like at work at equity trustees we refer to it as the for purpose sector because we actually see the for purpose sector as being in an incredibly broad ecosystem that's made up of traditional charities that are very much what we call deductible gift recipient status of registered charities etc right through to um, businesses that are PTY LTDs, for example, that actually are, are operating for profit, but with a purpose. So we see all of these different organisations sitting under the umbrella of for purpose. So you've got a whole range of, and you've got, and a lot of, to be honest, a lot of these social enterprises are um, side hustles for a lot of people. They're doing a day job. And I often reflect and a a lot of people reach out to me and say, hey, you've made the transition between corporate and, and for purpose. How did you do it? Um, and would you do it again? And, and for some people, I actually say, hey, you're probably more valuable to the sector if you stay in your corporate job and do this as your side hustle or, or, or donate your time or volunteer on a board. And um, so there's so many ways that you can input into this ecosystem it's just a, a, a matter of resourcing and capacity and desire really but to, back to your point Ben of of how do they all fit in um, again I think there's the pure traditional charity I think then there's an evolution of what we call um, a social enterprise and there's probably two types of social enterprise there's an enterprise that creates a product or creates a, um, um, a thing that is uh, distributed to the market with the profits from that thing going to um, a, a for purpose entity. So a really good example is there's a brand new product called Stuff, um, which is uh, men's um, skincare and shampoos and deodorants and things like that. That was actually the brainchild of um, an incredible um, guy called Hunter Johnson, who is actually a co-founder of Man Cave. So Man Cave are a charity that support young men and, and their masculinity and, and workshops in schools and, and enterprises. Um, but that was their social enterprise to create a product that is sold and then all profits from that product go back to the Man Cave to support more um, services to, to the community. So that is one type of social enterprise. You've got organisations like Street in Melbourne who um, uh, train young people who are homeless or unemployed to in ho um, horticulture and hospitality. They then work in a cafe called Street um, and they are actually given um, workplace skills um, in order to, for them to, to then move on to a, a full-time job. So that is yet another type of social enterprise. You've got Free to Feed in Melbourne, which is this incredible organisation that um, helps refugees and migrants to share their, culture, um, their food and their culture with um, members of the community via cooking classes and, and during COVID they've pivoted um, to deliver meals um, and, and, uh, and take away. So you've got all of these incredible um, entities that um, 
are purpose led. Yes, they might have a revenue stream and, and they're creating revenues, but fundamentally it's all about purpose. And then on the flip side of that, I used to work for an organization called YWCA. They actually had a um, hotel and it still exists. It's called the Song Hotel. It's on um, at the end of Oxford Street. Um, and all the revenues from that hotel are redirected to support women and children um, in the community. Yeah. So again, yeah. you've got all these incredible entities, but the fundamental um, focus of all of them is that they they there's there's a why for them around social issues or community or um, solving for a greater need and and that is and people I think as as you said before Ben the, these founders they they try and they identify an issue they identify something that they want to change and they find a mechanism in order to to affect that change yeah and I think what that's that's what I kind of see exciting about this section I think partly as I said this new world you know outside of the pure charities as we've said and how it's evolved as you've very eloquently described it from for me is it's kind of exciting I, I I think when you look at this ecosystem then then you know I, I and this has been my view of it is, is is how do we and how do others and this is called the second part of what I want to discuss today is you know the advice about how do we get people involved and because it's such a broad space. I think, as I said, I'm not a very good volunteer. If you, if you make me go and flip burgers at the school with the school, I end up upsetting everybody because, you know, I go into customer service mode there or they're having a chat and I'm like, that's burning. She needs a, he needs a burger. And it's kind of like, so I'm a crap volunteer. And, <laughs> and so and I'm quite happy to give good causes, money, etc. But it was interesting when I found that my leadership skills and my insight actually to some of these entrepreneurs and these social people with the cause some I think looked at me and thought oh my god he's a bit hardcore like you know commercial for profit but the others were saying to me actually Ben this is what I need to understand because there's so much expectation put on running these entities as well even you know for grants like I know you know just even the grant process is so involved and, and it's trying to understand how if people want to play in it, you know, what the opportunities are. So, so, so as I said, you, you give a lot of, a, you know, you see a lot of people will talk to you because you've got this sort of idea of both sides of it. And you said for some, it's a side hustle and that's joy to Blake's and ours is because we talked about that. We did a pod two, I think was, I'm a professional, get me out of here. And we're a big <laughs> advocate of the side hustle, right? We said to people, like, don't resign because you need to keep going, but what can you I do definitely. outside of this? And, and I'm interested. I mean, you know, is, is it about understanding the sector and then finding where you can play? Is it about finding that purpose, first of all? Is it about what are you interested in? Like, if I'm brand new to this and I want to give back, like, where do I start? Yeah, definitely. And and we often talk in, in the philanthropy world around it's, it's about time, money and skills. So philanthropy isn't just about the dollars, although that is a, a that's what the charities are, are definitely keen to hear. <laughs> um, uh, but it's it's a combination of all three. I think um, I've got a I'm working with a philanthropist at the moment. She's she's a next generation philanthropist and, and supporting her family around their giving, and she's a perfect example of this. She's exploring her why. She's really trying to figure out what she wants to do and how she wants to make an impact. And she's trying different things. She's she's reading um, articles, she's looking at, she's listening to podcasts, she's attending conferences to figure out what her why is. And, and I'm working with her at the moment with a particular beneficiary. And um, not only has she provided a financial donation, but she's actually also lending her skills in the social media space. So she's got a, a social media following. She's actually leveraging her profile to actually, to, um, promote this her chosen beneficiary and so for her this is part of her journey of figuring out what do I do I, I feel passionately about it at particular and for her um it, it's breast cancer and it, she goes I feel passionately passionately what else can I do and it's a little bit of a it's it's an experimentation process and it's an evolution of a journey and and I always recommend I, I Ben I, I tend to say the same thing I often say don't quit immediately um because to be honest working in the full purpose sector um isn't for everyone um but do your research go out and and talk to people and, and listen and learn and and do a side hustle volunteer um, there's so many like 
skilled volunteering particularly is is a massive need in our sector and Ben ex exactly what you've said in terms of your skills of, of of around facilitation and leadership and coaching is something that a lot of founder CEOs are, are um, absolutely like they're banging down our doors to and and seeking that advice and and particularly having the and as I said before charities have to be commercial these days in order to be sustainable they have to be very strategic they have to think about where they where the revenue is going to come from they have to actually have the governance structures in place and that's where corporate and commercial skills can really it'd be incredibly advantageous to provide some of that insight and perspective that we don't necessarily have in the sector it's, and it's so a, i think there's definitely yeah i was gonna say it's interesting because i think this is why it's so good talking to you because you know time money and skills sound, sounds like you know that that sounds like something tangible i can get my head around <laughs> and this idea of skilled volunteering see and it's interesting because i think there's a huge education opportunity now again i gotta i gotta you know it's actually a question I've got for both you guys is I feel as though as you know someone in their uh, later part of the life in the 50s that well, we were brought up in the old school which was very much make your money and then if you can give some of it away I see there's a real generational shift that people don't want to wait they want to get involved now and so you know Definitely. you're obviously in the place I mean Blake you got a you got a raft of I mean do you think this social consciousness is a generate I mean Everybody in every generation cares, but I think the kids seem to care. I say kids again, see, I'll go it's like an old bugger. I just think there's so much more awareness in the younger generations today about being a good corporate citizen. I don't know. Am I? I, I, th I think one reframing that's happened, one reframing that's happened for me is people are aware and sometimes incentivized to buy for social causes. So one really simple one that I would even teach kids in high school is, Hey, did you buy a red iPhone? Okay. Apple red is a product suite that all of the profits from that particular product suite go to AIDS research. And in the recent COVID-19 pandemic has been pivoted to that. So you see that, for example, myself, I didn't realize that I'd been kind of, I don't want to say duped, but like sort of gleefully duped into this <laughs> was I went to buy a brand new iPhone. I went to buy a brand new iPhone and I picked the Apple product red iPhone because I thought, well, I'm buying the iPhone anyway. This one says that it sends X amount of money to AIDS research. And that's something that I want to feel good about every time I pick up my red iPhone. Um, but if I then reflect on it, I go, how much do I even know goes to AIDS research, like what, what percentage of it actually goes? And this goes to what Denise's point is like, uh, some enterprises have done that thing where there's this sort of overwhelming, huge corporate entity lens that, oh, we're doing some kind of social enterprise on the side. And I think what has really changed and particularly in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is probably a positive, if there's any positives to take away is that people want to know that their money is going to their community to improve it. So if there are community organizations that have social things that are, that you will be able to see tangible benefits of, you know, those beautiful stories of like the Melbourne, uh, the charity drives, I'd actually heard about that. I didn't know the name of it until Denise mentioned it, but like food delivery and different cultural stuff to maintain that connection. I think that's critically important for people because for example, you know, you might want to go and buy a doll for, uh, for your, your, you know, a relative or your kids, like my, my kids are doll age. And there's a couple of really amazing indigenous artists who all the profits from their indigenous dolls that they create go to indigenous charities. And it's like, so instead of going to buy a cabbage patch, we bought the indigenous dolls because that's a, a, a charitable organization. you know, indigenous Australians personally, super passionate of mine that I go, well, that's where I'd rather spend my money. So I think that that's an, that's a, that's an awareness piece. And I think that's a cultural literacy piece that people sort of of our age have kind of gotten to. And I feel like the awareness piece for um, emerging sort of adults and young adults now is like actually getting them to pause and go, Hey, that awesome red iPhone that you bought because it made you feel better for one half second of dopamine when your parents purchased it, purchased it for you. Um, can we unpack why you, why you thought that that was making a difference? And I think that these global difference things are harder for people to wrap their heads around. It's now starting to come back to more localized difference and finding those charitable things. I don't know what you think, Denise. Yeah, no, Blake, it definitely, and we really saw um, that um, 
local impact um, come to the fore during the bushfires. I think suddenly everyone was like, I want to help my neighbour. I want to um, give back to the, the the local businesses in my area. I want to do a food drive. I'm, we're, we're going to do a convoy of cars down to um, to help rebuild. And we, I think uh, the bushfires was really that first, um, not the first, but the most recent sort of um, signal of, we want to make a difference in our in our local community, and and we actually really saw philanthropists um, reflect that in their giving, mm. um, in the last sort of 24, 48 months, with that okay, let's let's help out, let's support our backyard and out and the and the challenges right here at home, um, but I think most definitely millennials and and um, are are what we're calling the impact generation they are um, we saw it with the climate action um, protests with with all with a lot of um, I think there was also the couple of the school um, protests but we are seeing an activist activism element um, in our young people which is amazing and and particularly around and key issues of of mental health and well-being and and climate change and um and the like and it's really an opportunity i think to um sorry i was going to say the other the other thing we're really also seeing is as you said, young people making very conscious decisions um, um, and information is available to them. It's, it's very easy to jump on Google and do the research and, and understand the, the, the reasoning behind certain decisions and the why. Um, I was talking to someone recently and they are, um, are, have actually changed their bank accounts. Like they're obviously not a young person. Uh, they're they're a young adult but they've actually changed their bank they feel so passionately about um making a difference in in their day to day yeah well you know what my daughter who's at uni she did that she you know we set her up <laughs> in the bank account and then she's goes i've changed it and i'm like why I mean, and it was that the piece you know what i hadn't thought about and, and i guess it's it's what you've both brought forward and i always feel like for me it's like i'm just a bit slow and i'm catching up but i think you know the generation of ours, we were we were passive consumers of what was available. I think what technology is dra- driven is, and also opportunity. Let's face it, we've had a good run for 20, 30 years, right? So we're in a world, but the impact generation, again, see, now I've got the terminology. So I've actually got to, I've got to do another leadership session for another group of social entrepreneurs. And now I've got like skilled volunteering, impact generation, time, money, skills, because they always, they're always interested in what it is, but you know, this impact generation and how how to make conscious decisions because because i think you know that's actually what the box is about not 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 necessarily it's more about how you live your life and that awareness but it's the, it's the tools and the insights to be able to access that and i think like i said today on the call on the pod here we've kind of explored and you've given us such a good overview of what's available in terms of you know making your career choice but equally what's going on certainly here in australia which i know is represented in other parts of the world i I, we want to i want to wrap it up i just want to give the last sort of final five minutes or so i think there's a lot of people that get excited and are passionate about maybe starting something And, and let's look at it you know in terms of getting involved and giving back like what we've touched on it a little bit, like the first advice is don't just chuck in your day job, right? <laughs> so number one, <laughs> stop, yeah? I mean, what, what advice have we got? If people want to do more in this sector to get involved in this sector, what, what, what advice are you offering people when they're talking to you, Denise? Like what, what are the things you're telling them to go through to think about? I mean, we've covered it, but let's summarise it a little bit yeah. for everybody. I think research is absolutely critical and whether that's engaging with people in your network, reaching out to maybe organisations that you're passionate about, um, volunteering, testing testing the waters, um, whether that be um, attending events or, or volunteering. Um, but ask the questions and, 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 and understand what you're passionate about and then pursue options from there I think the other um the other thing to think about is that chances are and we see unfortunately a lot of this in the sector is we do see a lot of duplication of of effort a duplication of service um there are in amazing organizations out there that are probably doing something similar to what you might be passionate about look out for those um 
we, Ben and I work with a lot of uh, founders who um, have done exactly that. They've discovered that there is a gap in the market um, and they've created a solution for that gap. But more often than not, there will be an, an organization that aligns very closely to what you're passionate about. So it's understanding your why and your passion and, and doing your research. And, um, and also, it's it's just go for it and it's it's sometimes there is always going to be risk um and it's just a it's just a calculated risk yes yes it's interesting because we had michelle on talking about her career and she she said exactly the same about ask the questions and i think it's an interesting one because like i said we're talking about it in terms of different sectors and what's interesting but the process for me is the same you know know your why why are you passionate whether that's at work or whether that's looking to give back so you understand what motivates you which is this consciousness this conscious sort of awareness piece but then her advice is very much the same is don't be afraid to go and ask the questions you know it's okay to trial it's going and I love the fact and like I think you said you spoke to a lot of people before you made the shift and I still think it's something which is relatively underplayed I don't think people genuinely pick up the phone I know that's a bit old school isn't it or send the email or go and volunteer and turn up and I don't think there's any expectation on the entity to say you're here but they're happy to talk that's one thing I found in this sector is that people are more than happy to give you their time to educate to share because again, a large part of it is is more about we're bigger, we're better together, right? If we do this together, but Most you've got definitely. to show that initiative, right? It's it's it's, it's you've got to drive that, and then the opportunities yeah. are there. Oh, exactly. And and I have a personal philosophy that I will never ever say no to someone reaching out to ask ask me about how I got into this sector. I will never ever say no to a meeting or a coffee, and and part of it is is that. I had so many amazing people that helped me when I first started this journey and this is my opportunity to give back and and to build help build the capacity of this sector um, and and it's something it's a, one of the reasons why I love equity trustees is because that is fundamental to our philosophy is that we are here to build the capacity of the sector because t- it's only together that we can actually solve the problems that are out there we can't do this individually we have to do it together which again brings us back full circle to what you said at the beginning, right? It's your dream job. It's kind of the, you know, the opportunity to, to play, do what you're passionate about, but also to have a systemic impact on how this can grow and we can work to make something, which I think is only going to increasingly grow. I just think, you know, as people have had more time to reflect what they're doing with their lives, you know, the opportunity to have a career, but also to give back in whatever hybrid format that is or whether people make the shift. I think that's one of the joys of living in today's world. You know, it offers more choice. I think the challenge is always educating ourselves, as you said, and, and being able to then do a bit of homework, right? When all is said and done, more is said than done. Again, this is, you know, do the hard yards, well, not the hard yards, do the things that you're interested in, do the actions, and then opportunities will present. Very cool. I want to thank you for that. I've kind of like not only just ticked a box, but I feel as though every time we talk, I get a thorough education. And that's what that's partly the fun of it. You know, I feel like I'm I almost feel like I'm the one that's the laggard in this. So I'm, this podcast, <laughs> if nothing else, is giving me an opportunity to get people to educate me. And, and I think I think what will be interesting is obviously there'll be questions that will follow up. People can contact us through the website. I'm sure if they can find you and hit you up, they can do the homework for that. As you said, I just want to thank you for your time as ever. It's been, you know, just such a delight to chat. We will catch up again and we'll have a face-to-face are you lunch for this, which we'll do hopefully in the near future. Um, Blake, you and I'll catch up pretty again, pretty soon. We've got some more recordings to do anything you need to add before we sign out. I just want to, I just really want to hang um, on Denise's point for everyone about like, you really need to do the research, put the hard yards in because one word that I think comes up a lot in the sector, we didn't touch on it is like agitation. Right. And I think you have to be agitated to agitate. So I think that that research element is so strong. So yeah, do your reading. And when, if you do find those gaps or you find those causes and you see that, um, yeah, just lean into it. You know, we talk, Ben, Ben loves my lean into that, you know, lean into that, uh, that challenge and that, and that, and that gap and that, uh, and you'll find your passion. But Denise, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really inspirational. Thank you so much for your time. A disruptive agitator. Me. That's what you are, Denise. <laughs> Love it. Put that on your list. All right. Take care. Hey, we'll speak soon. Cheers guys. Thanks. Thanks.